Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Wednesday, December 8th. Derek Van Riper, Britt Giroli, Eno Saris here with you on this Wednesday. This is the episode in which we attempt to fix the CBA. If you're watching us on YouTube, it's just right there, just right under me. It just says, let's fix the CBA. We're excited about it. Uh, because there's like a few ways you can talk about what's happening in baseball right now with the lockout. You can be a fatalist about it and, and talk about how awful the fight is, which is awful, and it could take a long time. Or you could actually be more solutions oriented. And since it's only a Wednesday and we're all in a good mood, we're going to take the the latter route. We're going to try and be optimists. We're going to try and help fix these problems or at least come to some kind of estimate as to where some of the biggest sticking points are actually going to be resolved now sometimes the universe gives us a little gift and this is one of those days because we set this topic up uh, well kind of talked about it at the end of last week but i put it on the rundown on tuesday night and i woke up on wednesday morning to a kent rosenthal article that was basically let's fix the cba and it was step by step the big issues and he included some of his solutions so uh, it kind of works as a, a good outline for this particular topic in a lot of ways but before we go into Ken's piece and, and put his ideas out there with our own ideas. The thing that, that came up at the end of last week that's still blowing my mind, Britt, is the idea that the players have this war chest. And the more I've thought about it, the more I hope and think that it's more for leverage to move negotiations along than a thing that they'd actually want to use. Like it's a good thing to have and it gives them some protection. But my hope is that it's just a way of kind of showing the owners, hey, look, you don't need to drag this out. We've got this in our back pocket. So let's actually get this thing going and come together for something that actually works. Now, you know way more about this than I do because I didn't even know it existed at the end of last week. Am I reading what that tool is designed to be correctly? Like, is, is this the thing that you, you don't really ever want to have to use, but you're willing to use if you need to use it? Well, I think what its main purpose is, is to keep the players together as one. Because as this drags out, guys who are making the minimum versus guys like Max Scherzer, um, you're going to see some dissension, right? And that's what the union knows they can't have. They need all these guys to stay strong, all of them to kind of toe the line. So I agree with you. They don't want to use this war chest. Scherzer spoke about how they have it. They hope that they can use it on something else down the road. But they made it big. And they made sure that it's stocked up so that guys who start to get nervous if we're in January, February, about when they're going to get paid next, uh, know that this exists. And so they can feel better, more conf confident, more comfortable trusting this small subcommittee of players and the players union. So I think it helps, like you were saying, but I think its main purpose is to keep the players unionized and keep them unified in one goal because we talk about players versus owners, but it's important to remember that a lot of players aren't making the kind of money that these guys at the top or these guys that are on the subcommittee for the union are making. So uh, there's a lot of uh, differences and opinions just within the players, as I'm sure there are some within the owners, except at the owner level, they're all billionaires. I mean, Maybe some have more money than others, but we're really splitting hairs here. Um, this league has so many guys making the minimum that I think they had to do this because they needed to make sure that everybody stood their ground um, if this gets ugly and if this gets late. Yeah, I think the the unity thing cannot be under 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 underestimated because um, there's even if even when you look at the different proposals that are put out there and the different language that's out there, I think there's a lot of language and proposals that's designed to kind of like try to create fissures, you know. Um, when they have something in there, when the players have something in there saying uh, let's reduce or eliminate. Uh, uh, revenue sharing. Uh, that's, I think there's a little bit of a, that's designed to like let the Yankees do whatever they want, but it also is, it also puts a wedge between the Yankees and the Mar and the Mariners or the Yankees and the Rays when it comes to, you know, will they all vote the same way? Will they all think the same way? And I think there's other proposals that come from, uh, from, um, you know, ownership that is that are the same way. If there's a proposal about coming to free agency uh, at, at 30 or 29 and a half, it's something we've heard, right? Um, like that is actually designed to speak to the ones that became free agents. That's designed to speak to Aaron Judge, uh, who, you know, would be a free agent a year earlier. But you know how many people get to free agency? Not that many. It's, it's less than half. 
Uh, and so, you know, I think that um, the war chest speaks to the uh, more than half of the players that are on the minimum salary. You know, right. by my estimation, it was 54% in 2019. The union said 63%. That's a lot of people who are on the minimum salary. And yes, 500,000 is a lot. But, you know, if you sort of bank on the 500,000 and then it's not there, uh, then, you know, getting a, a few thousand to make rent and to maybe pay your local, um, you know, gym that you're, you're know, working out at or wherever, that sort of deal will be a big deal. So, and it'll keep, it'll keep the rank and file in order. And then the last thing I wanted to say about that is that like the, the, the way that the voting goes, and I've, I've had to confirm this cause I didn't actually know this myself until recently. We were all <laughs> trying to become experts on this stuff. Um, is that uh, the veteran subcommittee and uh, the player reps are the only people that vote on the proposal. Yes. And so uh, you basically, you hope that they are communicating well with their players that they represent. You hope that the union is, is communicating well with everybody and keep them on board. But in the end, the vote comes down to the veteran subcommittee and uh, and the player reps. And so this war chest, like you said, is a way to say to the guys who don't even have like a physical vote in the process to be like, hey, no, we've, we've got your back. Um, and that's why I think it's so important. You see this language even with Max Scherzer. You know, he comes out and he says, um, you know, it's, it's really important for us to get younger players played better, right? I think it's amazing. And then some people say, well, it's easy for you to say, you you know, just signed a huge contract. No, it, you know, it's actually easier for him to say, I made it, so can you, you know? You know, there's it's a lot it's a lot easier for to say, and you need the guys who make a ton of money, who are on the veteran subcommittee, who are in the leadership, you need them to care about the minimum guys. And I think yeah. sometimes in the past they haven't as much. Right. I, I think there's there's a prevailing attitude. I think this is in, in all sports in some ways where it's like, well, I went through this, so you can go through this too. And that Horatio probably applies Elger. to minor league pay, right? Like, Oh, we, yes. we ground it out. We had three roommates. We slept on mattresses on the floor. You know, we rode those bus rides and now we made it. And it's like, well, at a certain point, you have to realize that cycle will never end if the people who made it through don't acknowledge how terrible it is and then use their power to actually fix it. Right. So, I mean, that applies within the major league salary structure, but it also applies to the minor leaguers. And I still feel like the minor league issues are not even really on the table here like this the, it yeah. still feels like those are being cast aside but for me like when i think about what's going to be the biggest sticking point of all i don't know if the minimum salary is actually going to be the thing that hangs this up necessarily i, I think that's something that the, the players are going to get like it, it's pretty clear when you see every seen, cba like, there's a big jump in minimum salary Right. So I, I think that's very realistic. I think it can uh, big. You could define different ways. <laughs> well, there is a jump in minimum salary every every CBA. <laughs> yeah. The it Ken's was idea was big like for a K. while. Yeah. Which, again, I think people look at that number and say, like, this is absurd. But the 500K, like I was talking to a guy uh, yesterday who was kind of talking about how they get taxed in every single city they play in. Did you guys know that? Yeah. They get entertainer tax in every city they go in. They have agent oh, fees. They have on top of fees income tax. On top of regular income tax, it would be mm. like you. It would be like traveling when I traveled as a beat writer, and me having to fill out tax forms for every state I went to as a beat writer. They yeah. so they end up owing more than the average person. Um, they have the agent fees. They have the clubhouse fees that they have to deal with every year, and then they are in that really high tax bracket. And most of the time they are sole providers. So that 500 becomes 200 very quickly. Still a lot of money, but when you're talking about just being the head of household, because most of the time wives, girlfriends, fiancés can't physically work because well, of their also jobs. You're traveling you're, a lot. Yeah, somebody has to take yeah, care you're of the kids. Now, right, go ahead, you know. No, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, agreeing with no, you. I'm hyping you. <laughs> Keep going. Thanks, thanks. thanks. I, I need, I need the, I need the support. Sorry. Uh, no, you're, you're just now getting into like not as much money. So 800 to me becomes like 500, right? So now we're getting in more of what they should probably be making. Um, and everyone still says, well, this is absurd. Well, look at the sports profits. And, you know, I think you have a story that's going to delve into more of the numbers, right? Um, it hasn't correlated with the, the profits, right? The minor league salary hasn't gone up as much as the, the, the minimum. Yeah. Yeah. Which... Well, yeah, there's a couple of things I think of. First, on the tax thing, uh, it's really interesting. There was a piece that came out that said about how the ownership uses their teams uh, as tax havens, basically. And they write off when they when they spend like a billion dollars to buy a team or whatever, they write that off in perpetuity. So Mike, uh, who's it? Balmer. What's his first name? The Clippers owner? 
Steve Ballmer. Steve Ballmer uh, pays an effective tax under 10%. LeBron James uh, paid uh, an, attack, an effective tax per, uh, rate last year, forty percent, uh, because he doesn't have you know like a like a team to write off. And anyway, that's just tax rules, but it does have something to do with like uh, you know how these players get get taxed pretty highly. The other thing I think of is uh, the minimum salary is tied to this is what you were alluding to. The minimum tax is, is uh, the minimum salary is, is tied to the CPI, which is um, the inflation rate. So it is supposed to go up with inflation. So that means it goes up every year, sort of 3% or whatever. Baseball now compared to the last CBA uh, has is, you know, the overall revenues are around 11 billion. And in the last CBA, it was like 7 billion. So, so baseball profits are like going up at a sort of 40, 50%, you know, uh, you know, even like, you know, close to hundred percent, like almost doubling. Uh, whereas, you know, the minimum is just going up 3% every year. So you just see this, like you see this big sort of widening of, of the gaps. And, th and that's why every CBA, there's a, a new, there's a new minimum. The one thing I would say though, is that I think it's the most important issue, uh, in this because 60% of the players deal with this. Right. And, and I think it might shift a little bit of the power in terms of, would I sign Jed Lowry for next year for one and three to be my DH or to be whatever? Or would I sign, uh, you know, or would I depend on three minor leaguers and be like, one of these guys is going to be as good as Jed Lowry? Well, what if each of those minor leaguers costs a million dollars? Would you pay the one and three to make sure you had it? Or would you take three shots at a million dollar player? See, the math starts to change a little bit. And so, so I think it will favor some older veterans that are more projectable than sort of taking a shot in the dark on prospects if they're each going to cost a million when they get to the big league. So I do think the minimum matters that way. I think the minimum matters just in paying more than 60% of the of the, the player pool. Uh, the one thing I would say is I did the math and uh, it's a 200, like if you double the minimum, which no one's really talking about, but let's say you just did that and you made it like a million. It's a $200 million expenditure for the owners. Split 30 ways. Split divided by 30, which is what? Hold on. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, it's it, it's doable, but it, it's a bit, it's the biggest nut that anyone's talking about. Okay, so it's 6.6 6 million per team. Yeah. That's very but, little. But we're and, talking and, about... And disproportionately for the cheaper teams. Yeah, but aren't we talking about the how much more money and profits they made? What is the four billion dollars divided by? Sure, 30? sure, sure, sure. No, I'm not saying that it's not. I, I'm saying it's doable, and they should do it. And uh, I have a piece coming out tomorrow where there are things they can give the owners that can pay for it. So patches, for example, yeah. on the jersey, uh, could be worth eight million dollars to each team on average. Ding, boom! You paid for it. <laughs> that worked, <laughs> right? So we, did, we done. Right, we're done. But uh, the, the one thing that I have in this piece that's coming out tomorrow is I tried to put a dollar sign on the expanded playoffs, on the patches, on the eliminating a year of arbitration, on the NLDH, uh, on the doubling the minimum. And the amazing thing was when I added that all, all those five issues up, it netted out to zero. <laughs> You'd have to give all the money from patches to ownership, which uh, players may not want to do. And uh, there's some assumptions about how much a uh, a postseason TV uh, uh, game is worth to 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 the major league, to 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 baseball. But when I I did the math as best I could, and it all netted out. So the one thing I think that they're not going to get is the free agency quicker. I just think I don't think they get that. I, I think and it's a fact, non starter for it, owners. I yeah. I, Go ahead. I agree. Eno. No, I agree. I agree with you. You're saying it's a non starter for owners, and it just seems like. I think it's a non-starter for owners. And I also think that players don't realize, and I had this idea and I haven't heard anybody really talk about this. Um, cable subscriptions are down, right? They're going to continue to go down. These RSNs that were once cash cows for these baseball teams are going to lose money. They're going to continue to go down. The Sinclair right might there, go bankrupt. Yeah. Sinclair right might go bankrupt. Yeah. Is going to affect the money that they can give to free agents is going to affect the money that they have for teams. It's just going to affect a lot of things. And I don't think the players really understand the ramifications of that long-term, but I know the owners do. Um, I mean, ESPN, I think has like 
80 million subscribers right now, and they're projected in the next five years to be at 50 million. So we're, we're talking about like a, a serious decline that we're going to still see. And these RSNs, um, which used to be like, oh, get your own RSN. Now you can print money. Um, it, it's not going to be the case right now until they figure out some kind of solution. So that's like an important, I think, maybe perspective because we always hear from the player side and I am pro player, but I do think you have to look at it from the other perspective as well. And I thought that was a really important financial thing. That's really under discussed. There is yeah. one big change though. Like yeah, I'm totally with you. Like the Sinclair issue is a big roadblock and it might hangs over every act, sport, but it actually might be the kind of thing that pushes baseball or enables the league to finally get around the blackout issues. Like obviously they have more control then they would lead on, but I think it is complicated because those are all individual contracts with those RSNs, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. so it's a big legal mess to untangle. If the RSNs have to go away because Sinclair goes bankrupt, maybe you start fresh. Maybe you have a, a better version of MLB TV. Maybe you have a new partner like Amazon swoop in and say, hey, we're in the sports business now. We just got Thursday Night Football. Now we're going to have baseball too. And there's a big pile of money that comes in from Amazon. The other variable that wasn't there at the last CBA, sports betting. It's huge and it's going to keep growing. It's going to continue to become legal in a greater number of states. That's going to generate a ton of money for the league as well. So I think they can fairly easily offset those those losses or those changes because of revenue streams that weren't previously there. But it's definitely the kind of thing that creates some short-term instability or uncertainty on the owner's side that at the very least is is le it's leveraged at the table somehow or it's brought into the conversation regardless of how problematic it actually is in the grand scheme of things i think a lot of again we, we see that we saw this in the shortened season the shortened season was the the sky is falling we didn't make as much money the claims of losses right the same kind of thing can happen with the rsns even though we all know we can sit back and go well, but what what about the next 10 years like the next 10 years are still extremely bright as far as the amount of money that you're going to make like i think we're at a better point as far as what the players know and what they've kind of figured out about how everything works to where they're they can't lose in this negotiation the way they've lost in the last two like, it can't be this bad the free agency thing is interesting because i i think some of the some of the quotes and letters and things that come out of this like everything Manfred has released as a statement is just like, it feels like parody. And then people write parody off of it. And then you're like, yeah, this really is pretty bad. Why, why do they even try to argue at this point that it's some kind of crisis for the game that players change teams? We love that. What just happened before this lockout? Players were going all over the places. We had signings. We had trades. We love signings and trades. Like, I think there's this, overcorrection sometimes where people are like, oh, we just we just want players to stay in one place forever. No, no. We want the stars to stay, like the homegrown stars. If we're a fan of a team, we want those players to stay forever. Right? Rays fans want Wander Franco to be a Ray forever. But that doesn't happen. Even for the, the best of the best stars, that hasn't been happening for years. Like even Ryan Braun was an outlier in Milwaukee. And if it weren't for that PED suspension, Maybe he would have been a Dodger for the last few years of his career, right? Maybe his appeal to other teams would have been greater. So I just think it's weird that they that the ownership side of this has tried to make players changing teams like some kind of issue when I think more fans like it than dislike it because it creates a lot of excitement. It, get, the possibility of getting new players and making your team better is more exciting than gridlock and everyone just staying in the same place. Yeah, and I think the only way to keep like Kutch a uh, pirate for longer for as an example is wage suppression you know uh i don't i don't think there's a, a really great way to keep him on the team uh, you know the whole restricted free agency that sort of deal um i think that only really works in the nba because they have a cap and because they have a floor and, and i don't know that it necessarily would work in our in our situation it, because i i just don't think that like if they went back to the pirates you know to i think the pirates would would never equal that amount right <laughs> like if the if who who signed the pirate who signed kutch out of uh out of, out of uh, the, yeah they traded of, him to the giants that's right he was in the giants for a little bit they get traded then, the, yankees, the yankees and then he signed with the phillies okay but let's say he just signed with the phillies there's no way the pirates would have matched that they would have let him go 
yeah. then you're just talking about like sort of qualifying offer nonsense. So I, 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 I one thing that I do want to react to is like, it is funny that you, you talk about these Manfred comments and then, you know, Clark says, you know, Clark says drastic Manfred says extreme. There's all this, you know, sort of we're parsing these, uh, you know, public statements from these figures. Uh, the one thing that it does point to that I do get a sense of is that there is vitriol. Like there is, there is the, there's an emotional gap between these two. And I think the players feel like they need to, to win something. So uh, there's going to be some line drawn in the sand somewhere. I don't know what it'll be. Um, and then I've seen other people say, like, if they only give a come away with $800 million minimum salary and expanded playoffs, that'll be a loss. I don't know, man. That's that's a big jump. That's the biggest jump ever in the in the history of the of the minimum salary. So, you know, I think I think I would focus all my efforts on the minimum salary myself. Really? Much- See, I would focus all my efforts on fixing the draft because nothing fixes the competitive integrity of the sport faster than fixing the draft. Like, if, if you ask me, I think the two biggest things – and players have said that these are the two biggest things are the salary and also getting teams to try. So Mm -hmm. I disagree. You know, I think if they got those two things that you said, they would consider it a failure. They Mm -hmm. need to fix the competitive integrity of the game. They can't just have players make 800 grand and think that everything is fine. The sport is fixed now. And I thought Ken had a really good point in his article about how, okay, maybe we don't get rid of revenue sharing because the league won't agree to it. And it does, it is unfortunate for teams that are using that money and trying, but maybe we have stringent rules on how they can use that money, right? They shouldn't let the Orioles pocket $50 million. That needs to go directly into payroll, right? You should, you ha- your payroll. payroll should be at least as high as the revenue sharing you got, you keep brought in. Revenue sharing plus the money they make from MLB.com. So now you're talking about pretty much every payroll is $100 million. That, that, so, I like that too because you're getting a salary floor without calling it a salary floor. Yes. So I thought that that, that to me, or those to me are the two biggest things. If the players get that, they should just be like, let's shake on it. We're good. You know, like not fight mm-hmm. so much over the free agency stuff. Um, you know, I think if that they have would- a minimum salary and they fixed the competitive balance somehow, the, the integrity of the game and stop the tanking. I think, wouldn't we all feel pretty good about that on this panel? I think that would create also some incentive to to compete because let's say your payroll has to be a hundred million. That means you have to buy some free agents. And that means the money you're, you'll be, the money you'll be making comes from the gate and your local TV. When well, local TV might, you know, it's tough to negotiate, but gate now, now all of a sudden gate is really more important. Like making, Tickets sold more important is good because that would mean that people would try to be more competitive because the only way to reliably get more gate receipts is to actually try and win. That's <laughs> that's the only yeah. thing we've been able to, to prove. So, yes. All right. I, I can feel I can dig it. And what I like about that, too, is that you uh, you can throw different proposals at each other. And it's not obvious that they cost anybody money, that they cost the owners more money specifically you know and and it, it could be a wedge issue between the poor and rich owners <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's uh it's definitely something you know if you don't do it that way then maybe you do it with draft incentives that's where you started right draft right, incentives yes. mm-hmm. or uh change change the draft pick compensation in uh in the luxury tax implications that so just take the draft pick stuff out you know uh yeah. you know do do find some way to like uh to to stop tanking. I I'm, I'm with you. I'm just focused on that. I see that 60% on the minimum. And I'm like, that's, that's my laser focus. Yeah. Uh, I think the draft, like trying to, trying to fix it through the draft is like, it, it is part of a bigger solution. I, I, I don't like that the worst team in the league that isn't trying to put a winning product on the field right now creates the best path for the first overall pick. So whether that's, you know, lottery or, a different system entirely where the first non-playoff team like backing up for a second expanded playoff seems like it's almost a certainty at this point like i'm in my mind i'm operating like we're going to have 14 and teams in the playoffs and that's so the details of that is be. really important because of what we're talking about right because right. if it's just everyone's in and you know there's a first round that sucks then everyone's going to try and be an 84 win team yes. no there so needs you- to be a big weight on winning your division and bar- barely first getting in by. needs to be tough yes. like you need to be on yes. the road entirely when you have right that opening that's series interesting and- a whole home series wow. uh, or i like the idea of the uh of the top wild card choosing their opponent you know i like that sort yeah. of stuff 
I love that I just from like a like a schoolyard standpoint where it's like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can't wait to like write that article too. Like who should the you know yeah. who should Yankees, they pick? <laughs> Yankees get to the postseason and they're like we want the twins because we destroy them every year. And then the one right. year the twins are finally gonna punch the Yankees back and win one. It's gonna be amazing. Like, right. Like how great, great yeah. would it be if you got picked by the number one wildcard team and you beat them? You're like, ah. amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's great TV. Like they could do a whole special where they do the selection where they the team the two wildcard teams pick or whatever. Yeah, and you're yeah. like, I don't know, it could be fun. But yeah, I think I think the the salary stuff's important, but I think the game has to be better. Like the collective bargaining agreement, they're trying to make the game better each time, in theory, right? right. They're trying to sweeten the deal for each side, but they should try. If we're not gonna fix any rules, then we better fix the tanking. And yeah, they already well, said they're not fixing rules. I, I, there's a there's a couple things that I think are definitely going to happen. To this that I don't think most people think would improve the game. So we're already going to be down, which is expanded playoffs and patches on jerseys. Like those are already in. That's already happening. That's going to happen in every. It's, it's already it's happened already, in the NBA. Yeah, uh, I think yeah. it's it happened in hockey. At least in the preseason, I've seen it in hockey. I've seen it in practice jerseys for the NFL. That's coming everywhere. I mean, yeah, the the world's sport. Soccer, football. As I know. I can't else. believe it. It's right yeah. across, right across the, chest. the front. Like, yeah. yeah, like yeah. you. If you don't know the crest, you you, you know Yokohama Tire Corporation is Chelsea. <laughs> like yeah. you get yeah. it in your head that that's that's who they are now, right? So like traditionalists out there are screaming right now. It, it just they're out walking their dogs. They're in their cars. They're like, what are you guys doing? Look, it's coming. A Mister Clean Patch or whatever is coming on everybody's jersey. It's going. Just accept that. That is part of the reality, right? This is a fight about money and to generate more money to keep everybody happy. You need some new ways to make that happen. This is one of them. And if this actually gets us baseball, if this actually does raise the minimum salary, if this is the kind of thing that eventually gets more money to the minor leaguers, please put a patch on the jersey. I can see through it. I'll be okay. Trust me. It's not the end of the world. I think the, the other fight here is with the floor and the luxury tax. And I think the luxury tax is a cap. Like it's not called a cap, but it functions as a cap. How? Let's just say we do have a, a salary floor, however realistic that is. Let's say we have a floor, and it's a it's a hundred million per team based on the criteria we were talking about earlier, right? There's some some pretty clear indicators that that's what teams will just have readily available. It goes back into payroll. Do you, if you can't get rid of the luxury tax completely, how much do you want to soften it? How much do you want to let Steve Cohen come in and and just buy all the players he wants. Like from a pro labor standpoint, my mind is great. Awesome. Let him run a $400 million payroll. What do I care? Does that create as much of a competitive disadvantage as people might fear? Because I would argue that you can spend a whole lot of money and screw it up. There are plenty of teams that run bloated payrolls relative to other teams that don't have on-field success. I'm looking at you, angels, looking right at you. So, I don't see it as that much of a problem. I think the fear would be you create situations like you have in other leagues, like soccer, like another good example where teams spend like the big, big rich teams spend a fortune and everybody else is trying to play catch up. Maybe you create that scenario, but part of what fixes that is that 14 team playoff. Like if you're putting 14 teams in the playoffs, eventually you're expanding to 32, you're still sitting right around half the teams getting in. Okay. Like so the Mets, the Dodgers, the Yankees, the Cubs, like those teams spend a lot more than everybody else. Are they going to win a lot more than everybody else? I, my lean is actually no. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I think you have to raise the luxury tax and like Ken wrote, get like soften the penalties because you still have revenue sharing. So to me, you have to, you have to do something with that. And as for the floor, it's never going to get a, agreed upon by the owners. And also the players aren't huge fans of the floor. Um, because if you look at the salary floor, it doesn't actually incentivize teams to spend, uh, money in a measured way. It just incentivizes them to sign like one old aging veteran and then still do whatever they want with their roster just to hit the minimum. Um, so the floor actually, uh, labor people feel this way too. doesn't actually incentivize teams to try. I think they have to find other ways to do that. Um, uh, but the luxury tax, you're right. It's a cap. It's absolutely a cap. And there are no... In, I don't have a problem with Steve Cohen or other teams flying through it. Baseball is the best at having different champions over the last, what, like dozen years? So the parity in the game is there. I don't think it, it's going to go away if you all of a sudden um, 
make it a little bit uh, less harsh for teams that hit that luxury tax because it is now really being treated as like a stop, can't go past this number, right? We see teams do it all the time. I think only two teams went above it this year. Is that right? Dodgers and the Padres? Yeah, you got you, you just you can't you can't have only two teams spending at that level. That seems way more problematic. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. I think you have to do something there, like maybe get rid of some of the penalties associated with it because it's it's not making the game better. It's just giving the owners a reason to say we have to stop here. The king of waffles looks like he is deep in thought. He's like looking something up on the internet. I am looking something up on the internet. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to get some numbers about uh, revenue sharing um, and how much some certain teams come in. I saw one that said the Pirates took $118 million in, in 2018. Uh, but I'm looking at a different piece that says, that it seems more plausible about uh, revenue sharing, giving like the Rays and the Marlins about forty million. Do you know how much the MLB.com money is? I think it's around fifty million, or it was a few years ago. Wow. Okay. So if that's the case, then we're talking about uh, you know like maybe a ninety million dollar floor, maybe a hundred million dollar floor for, but it, it would be for specific teams. But the Orioles are on that list. Uh, the Pirates are on that list, and um, uh, they were all in the bottom three last year. So uh, the Pirates spent $34 million last year on payroll. That, uh, that should not be allowed. They probably brought in around uh, $40 million in revenue sharing, according to this. I'm looking at the captain's blog uh, piece from 2020. Uh, if they brought in $40 million in revenue sharing plus MLB.com, that means... Uh, before they sold a single ticket or whatever, they brought in like $60 million or $50 million. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. wonder where that money went. Yeah. Plus their RSN money. Right. Whatever they get there. Plus the, the jersey sales, all that. Orioles, Orioles at $29 million. It, it, The Guardians at $29 million last year. Oh, this is this year. Like I mean... Oh, where they're at right now. It's just sort of embarrassing in my mind. Like it, you shouldn't be allowed to own a team if you can't spend a hundred million dollars on your payroll. Right. Which in right. a, in a, va- in a, like in a vacuum, like a standalone statement, it's like, wow, that sounds like a lot. No, no, no. Like, re- like read that pro publica piece that, that, you know, was talking about earlier, like understand how much money yeah. they actually have to work with. And it is actually a very small okay. sort of request. Well, last year was the pirates were 54 and the Orioles were 42. So still pocketing millions. Look at the Orioles payroll in like 14, you know, Um, they spent a lot of money. And so now they're a great example. Now their payroll is really low and everyone's like, well, they're rebuilding. Well, that's fine. But is this 50 million that they're saving every year? Is that going to go towards payroll? Are they going to all of a sudden spend another 200 million one year? No, they might go up to. Oh, and you know, what's also not going to happen is ticket. I mean, ticket prices might go down just because they're bad and nobody wants to go, but it has nothing to do like paying money, that's a big trope that is out there is that, that, you know, if the players cost more money, the ticket prices will go up. And I, I don't think that's the case. I think that uh, the, the price of the ticket that you buy to go to a game depends almost entirely on you, on your demographics. Like they've, they know everything about you and how much they're, they figured out how much you would pay. You know what I mean? So uh, we haven't found any uh, ability to prove that like a high price free agent drives ticket demand. Uh, And so therefore, if there's no link there, then your demand won't change for that ticket. And so it'll only depend on how much money you have, uh, how good the team is, whatever their inputs are. But, you know, I don't think one of their inputs is how expensive the players are. They're, They're figuring out exactly how much you would spend on a ticket. Yes. So in the NFL, it's a different beast, but each team gets $252 million for national TV money before anything. So their TV money pays for their salaries. So yeah. the tickets, everything else is just gravy, right? Um, so in baseball, um, I know it's crazy. And, it's... you know, <laughs> they still can't get people to go to FedEx Field to see the Washington football team. Um, I wouldn't go. So, you, you couldn't, you could, you could give me free tickets and I would not go. <laughs> I, this was, I, you guys should, I, I do a radio show in DC a couple nights a week. And that was the whole debate is, so why can't they lower ticket prices? Because it's literally just extra money for them, right? They are not right. paying for player salaries from your tickets. And it's the same thing in baseball. We just determined that each team gets about 90 to a hundred million 
gets that money? What about that's just given to them. Now, if they're spending less than that on their payroll, then all that ticket stuff is gravy. Mm -hmm. What about the money the club generates? Are all these clubs gen operating at losses every year? Maybe on their taxes, but certainly not in the real life. Mm -hmm. So again, your ticket prices, these tickets, what you're, you're, you're not funding player salaries when you go to a game. We are not doing that. They're already being funded by these revenue sharings. That's a, Yeah, that's another good point. Yeah. Revenue so, sharing, national TV deal, local TV deal. Mm -hmm. Most All of these right. teams, yeah, most of these teams don't need the ticket. And I think that makes sense to, if you're running a business, to not depend on the most volatile thing, right? TV money is locked in for 10 years at a time. You know, all these, all these national sharing deals, they're, they're locked in. So you, what you want to do is be near break even before you sell a ticket. And then the profit is how many tickets you sold. I mean, it makes sense from a, a nerd angle, but you know that's that also tells you why the player prices don't really matter to your ticket price. So all of this is to say, so kind of recapping the things that we think we're going to see, the, the likely compromises, going through the Ken piece, the luxury tax, we think the tax is going to go up, but it's not going to go away. And maybe the penalties for going into the luxury tax will be less harsh. So more room to operate, good for the players. Uh, less harsh penalties, maybe a more, I guess, a greater appetite in season, especially if you have a contending team to push extra chips in because you're not paying as much of a penalty per dollar for going over. That seems likely to happen to both of you. Okay. As long as it stays in place. Yeah, I think, you know, there there will be changes to the luxury tax. I agree. And then the, yeah. the revenue sharing Ken had keep the formula the same, but require recipients to spend a major league payroll. This effectively replaces the the salary floor, right? We're saying that you have this known quantity of, of revenue coming in from TV and MLB.com. And even if it's not written expressly as here's a hundred million you have to spend, it's these, these things that you're going to get have to go back into player salaries. And then other ways teams make money aren't factored into that calculation. And Maybe. people are, you know, players are better off. And then you're not committing to an actual number. Is, Let me is pause here real quick. Lands? Do the Rays and the Yankees both like the, like both equally like and hate these proposals? Yeah, it's kind of the, the sniff test, right? For, for teams being on board, right? Do the well, Rays, so the Rays are like, oh, okay, so now I got to spend more money. Thanks. And you've just allowed the Yankees to spend more money. Well, so the Yankees like it. The Yankees like it. I think but, they just but like here's it. The eh, does, uh, this does, does Hal, I don't think Hal Steinbrenner wants to spend more money on payroll because that's, no, a, he's, that's he's, a good he's, a he's a classic. My excuses go out the window. <laughs> yeah, like and there, there's like there's as much pressure there to spend as much as you can as there is anywhere. He doesn't do it. No, that's a good here's, point. Here's the thing: it's like the teams can't really. They're fighting over money, right? In this instance, telling play, telling teams, you need to use the revenue sharing money for this. They can't really complain about. It's not like costing them money. It's just allocating those funds to what they were meant to do that teams have kind of, it was just too broad. It was like they had to somehow improve the organization. So now they're just basically saying, you need to improve the big league team with that money. So to me, it's hard for them to say that this is somehow negatively going to impact their economics when this is money they already have. I think the other question here is how much does tanking and rebuilding hurt you as a team? How much does that hurt your brand? How much does that hurt like from a, from the bottom line perspective? Because if you run it lean payroll wise, you're still churning a profit. So it seems like the answer is not that you lose much. a lot of fans though. And it's hard. It's back? hard to get the fans back. You actually have to win for a few years before the fans start coming back. Right. And then it gets, then it gets into a question of how, how effective was your rebuild? The, the Astros tank to what they are now looks like more of an outlier. That doesn't look like a recipe that every organization is going to follow with success. There are some teams that tore it down and will stay broken indefinitely. I think of the, the, the Rangers. The Rangers kind of did a little bit of a tank, you know, at first with, with Daniels. And then they got to a point where the players came together. And then now they're then they took a step back and started over like, right. Like the kids have been a little bit of a perpetual rebuild in Texas. 
Yeah, well, what? But they had those World Series appearances. Yeah, they're they're a little more up and down, I would say. They're, so, they're not. They weren't just like big drop and then now finally coming out of it. I, I mean, I think the Orioles, for obvious reasons, have followed yeah. that Houston model. And is it is it actually going to have a payoff like that? The Cubs one was really question. interesting because they got the World Series, but it just it seems uh, kind of I don't know. I, I'm not a Cubs fan, so I can't speak for all Cubs fans. But I will say. That I'm like that. I'm like, if they hadn't won that World Series, I would be like, that was an unsuccessful rebuild. Well, here, okay, unsuccessful so here's the tank main, cycle. Yeah. The problem now is that tanking doesn't work anymore. I talked to a bunch of people at the GM meetings about this. Um, it doesn't work anymore because teams don't trade away prospects like they used to, mm-hmm. like they did when the Astros were rebuilding. So you can't. You can't keep tanking and only get like some good draft picks yourself. But unless you supplement that with other people's prospects so they all come up at the same time to create this good team mm-hmm. um it just doesn't happen so i believe also Jeff Hoyer has the talked more people about tank this. the more people tank the more people are going for that number one pick so you're not as likely to get the number one pick if there's five teams tanking now all of a sudden you got the five pick and the five pick is not as good as the number one pick like there's a pretty big, big drop off yeah depending on the draft but yeah so mm. tanking just isn't feasible anymore so that's like another reason why they need to fix the draft in my opinion is that like clubs are re- always going to be in, there's always going to be rebuilding to some extent you know like if the pirates win they're going to win differently than the yankees the way they're going to win right yeah, but the the tanking cycle um is not good for the game and it just doesn't work anymore when was the last tank we talked about the astros that was a while ago now what was the last really successful tank job that produce like a consistent winner everyone points to the astros that's it yeah and they spend now they got good and spend jim crane doesn't want to rebuild ever again he said this year at the world series we're all in a big group that the window is never going to close while i'm here like he's not like eager to like some teams are we win now we're going to tank and and tear it all down again this was like a one-time only tank thing for them Maybe. I mean, it, it looks like they'll let Korea go, and so they'll get cheaper, but they'll try to... But they're not but, tanking and rebuilding. Right, yeah. I, I got to follow up on something you've, you've said a couple times, Britt. Fixing the draft. Like, what for? What does that look like to you? Like, what? Is, how, how do you fix it? I mean, I think it's it's very difficult to just build an entire system effectively. Like, if... Even if you like, are we leveling the playing field in terms of where the top picks go? Are we disincentivizing tanking directly, like we said earlier? Like, what what is your fix for the draft? Yeah, I think you draft lottery it, but you also weigh the team who didn't make the playoffs, like the teams who just missed the playoffs, um, have better chances to draft higher. I also think you have to give some but- kind of extra weight to small market teams. Uh, when it comes down to it, like if the Rays were on the outside looking in and they were the first team and then the Yankees were there, I think the Rays, in some extent, maybe get an extra draft pick. I think you have to do something. You can't do away with the small market, big market thing. There are still some significant hurdles to winning as a small market team, and they are going to need the draft more than the big market teams. Uh, but you have to find a way to get teams to stop the race to the bottom. And I think you do that by a draft lottery that really takes away the whole, well, if we're the worst team, we can just keep picking number one. We can keep getting the Adley Rushmans. Like, that's not a feasible strategy. Well, it's not good for baseball, at least. And, but the one thing that I don't like about the first one missing is a lot of times it would be like the Yankees. And all of a sudden, will you incentivize the Yankees to miss the playoffs by a little would the, bit? Would the Yankees fans be to happy a, missing the playoffs one. to get a draft pick? That's not going to fly. Right. Well, again, I think we're talking about a lottery scenario, though, where the first, like yes. the first team that didn't make it, has the best chance of getting the first pick, but doesn't necessarily get the first pick. And I think, you know, Britt, I think you're saying you want to keep the competitive balance draft picks, or even tweak that system to maybe push more in the direction of of smaller clubs, right? I mean, that that's effectively what you're what you're saying. Yeah, that's how I would do it. And again, like, you know, I don't think teams that just missed the playoffs, their fan bases are going to be comforted by the fact that they now have a high draft pick on a lot of these fan bases. Because be they, like, they were in the we're winning cycle. They thought, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, the the way that you put it with the like sort of the lottery ball, the, like you get more balls for certain things like I kind of I, I OK, I get that, you know, like you get more balls if you you get a couple more balls. If you're a, a small market team, you you maybe you get an extra ball like you can kind of almost treat it like like that, like you get a ball yeah. for being the top 
uh, playoff misser. You get a ball if you're a revenue sharing. You get an extra ball if you're a revenue sharing team, you know? And then we do descending amount of balls based on worst record. But the, the, these little, the pink, the ball themselves, like the, just another chance, you know, can then become this, like, this incentive. How uh, fun would that be to watch? Uh, all the Ma- Rob Manfred like picking out the the ping pong balls, reading the team. Well, you got to have Mike Petriello up there explaining why you know the Rays got <laughs> you know eighteen <laughs> balls and the you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like it. Yeah. Uh, the, I, need, the, I need someone the, with charisma to be in charge of because that that feel. I mean, I like game shows. I I think that's a game show kind of thing. You, you need a you need a charming very charismatic person to pull. We well, got to have the commission balls. come up and play the like, and with the, you know, and right. For the sure. First yeah. Pick, you, you, got, you could have the you monotone know. commission. And you got to have the nerd being like, well, they got this one for the, the eight, right? <laughs> well, the, the first one's out in their revenue sharing. So they got four, three percent. But you chance. do need like yeah. the Dicky Vital like doing the actual tumbling, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you need a hype person. Uh, yeah. Maybe you could get the guy that does the auction. That's on, great, uh, baby. <laughs> the number one pick goes to, <laughs> So free agency, we think, is gridlock. Still going to be six years. Can we get to be tweaked where the BS of holding a player in the minors for 11 days goes away? Can we just like round that off? Like oh, It's still six years to free agency, but a day equals a year. Yeah. So Bobby Witt Jr. can come up on opening day if he, for whatever reason. If he weren't ready or if he got hurt in spring training and he came up in August, it's a year. A day equals a year. All right, you, you spend one day in the big leagues, you've, you've reached a year. Can, can we tweak it that way if we're going to keep it at six years? Or do you think that's a non-starter? I think Ken proposed that, right? I don't know about the issue there. What if you have a prospect who comes up, isn't very good, you send him back down for most of the year. Now he's got a year of big league year. service time? Yeah. yeah he's, he's not getting – I mean, it, t- time is working against these players. The peak age is younger than we thought. And if you aren't going to let guys get to free agency – after a shorter duration, I mean, a fewer number, a smaller number of years, at least, at least take away this goofy little game we play. Like a guy who's big league ready should play in the big leagues. That's good for everybody. Yeah. Why not? I get that. But on the flip side, like I said, what about a guy who comes up, isn't very good, then spends the year in the minors because he's not very good? I mean, I think one of, the dumbest, be- one of the dumbest stories I ever wrote was that the, uh, Rangers were practicing manipulation on Willie Calhoun. <laughs> when it turns out, his defense wasn't actually that good. It just wasn't that good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like he kind of needed more time in the minor leagues. Whoops. I don't know if this has been floated. What if they made free agency? What if they were like, okay, free agency can be the six years or whatever, or X amount of games played, which which gets rid of the like manipulation by days. I don't know. Hmm. Does that make sense? Like a guy who has played X amount of games in the big leagues is also a free agent, even if he only had five years of big league service time. So yeah, you could you could add you could add extra paths to reach it. Like you have the current system, but you also have faster tracks for guys that are, are playing more. Maybe that could replace Super Two. Like you could say Super Two is not actually that effective, but if you are playing regularly over five years, you hit I don't know seven hundred games or whatever that number is for for a hitter, and maybe it's uh, one hundred and twenty five games for a pitcher or something. You get a you got to find some way to balance this out, though, because you know, relievers versus starters becomes a different issue. Right. But maybe there is some other way. I just, I, I don't think there's any other sport in the world. Maybe I'm completely blanking somewhere where you wouldn't put your best player on the field as soon as possible. Like that seems fundamentally flawed. You can't tell me that front offices are sitting there like, yeah, you know, we want to wait 11 days before we use this guy. They do it because they get the guy for the extra year. Take away that carrot. Everyone plays their actual best player when they think that player is ready. I mean, I think that's what it comes back to for me. You're right, Britt. Like, you could be 100% wrong. You could, Bobby Witt Jr. could be on the opening day roster and he could be awful for the first month and they could have to send him down. At the same time, I don't know if you want to say that he has to be up all year to get a full year of service time because if they do the up and down game and they can do it based on games or do it based on days the way they currently do, it takes them eight years to get the free agency instead of the six that it's supposed to take if they play that game. And I, I just think the, the more we can do to, to cut through that clutter and create a system where teams are playing their best players as much as they possibly can, that's generally good for just the well-being of the game. And obviously it's good for the players. I think there's an obvious solution. And I think I, I think that everyone hates it, 
So maybe it's an okay solution. <laughs> uh, start your start the service time clock when they're drafted. So obviously the players would have to give a few more years back. It couldn't be six anymore. Well, mm. my the big problem with that is high school versus college guys. Now you're going to impact who they take. Yeah. Because it takes much longer for high school guys to right come up. So now you're placing the high school guys at a disadvantage. So you're changing fundamentally teams' draft strategies. Are we making this worse? Yeah. I mean, that's, what, really I think that's what happens. I think what happens is like you, there's all these implications and all these things. But that's that. I mean, that just without the details, just that concept of starting service time when you're drafted, I think would be ideal. You know what I mean? In terms of like incentives to getting them to the big leagues. Here's the thing: you I, only have them for a certain amount of time. If they're ready, uh, you want them in the big leagues. You could sign Russian back to guys, extensions, guys. though. Hold hold on a minute, though. Like everybody, this is this Russian. goes back to people leaving. Like what? If you yes. draft a player and you've got, let's say, let's say it's seven years, we, we put the number regardless of whether you're a high school. But what player. if you make it nine for high school and seven for 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 college? They would come out about the same time into free agency. I think. Yeah, but as the team yeah, that you'd drafted have that player. Like that. You could still extend that player. It's not just this inevitability that the player is going to leave. Like you, st- at this th- that yes. fear of the player is going to leave. Agency, like, right, right. Extend them if, if you shorten it up. Extend them if they're good. Extend them. Pay them. You want to keep them. They're good players. You want to keep good players. Probably, I think if you did, I think if you did nine and seven, um, the the average college player, uh, you know, uh, gets drafted at like 21, 22, right, twenty one would be a free agent around 30 and may may play more often you'd have some extra arbitration years and those arbitration years pay okay they don't they they pay a lot better than the minimum so if they only had three years minimum maybe a lot of those three years minimum would be replacing minor league years when they're making like twenty thousand they'd all be suddenly making seven hundred thousand right i don't know anything you do with the draft anything you do with the draft is crazy because like so okay so say you fill out your draft and then the, the late round picks, teams are just taking high school guys instead of college guys because they, they have want for the nine. extra. Yes. So the, maybe the creme de la creme guys, the, the college guys who are really ready will still go because they're like, oh, we're not worried about that. He's going to be ready in a couple of years. But now you're sending a uh, bunch of high schoolers to make $20,000 a year in Modesto or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. It's just uh, the issue is, is like. So as you guys know, I did that big story about the trade. Like, should there be a deadline? There shouldn't be for all these different reasons. And I think it was um, it was Heim Bloom who said, no matter what rule you do, you have to remember that there's 30 really competitive GMs and free offices that Broken are going to find loopholes. Yeah, <laughs> loopholes. You have to remember, like, we're, we're kind of smart. These people are really smart. Yeah. They're going to find people. As soon as the CBA comes out, there's just going to be groups of people in think tanks wondering how they can make this CBA work for them. Yeah. So I don't know. We sit here and we throw ideas out that seem fine, but then you wonder what the ramifications are. And then even really smart people like might not consider what happens like three or four years down the line, you know? Yeah. Like there are there are unintended side effects to almost everything. What happens if you draft a college guy, you know, and he needs Tommy John surgery? Now you're now you're real now you're maybe not gonna draft that guy at all because now he's wasting those years of the eligibility clock is ticking. Mm. What if a so guy needs any college Tommy player Johns? with any injury whiff all of a sudden plummets in the draft? Yeah, like what if he needs two Tommy John surgeries? Is he going to just end up being a free agent even though he's barely had any time in the minor, like minor leagues? Yeah, I mean, I think that should be, yeah. That's I okay. mean, look, the, the way I would look at it. It would incentivize them to figure out the injury thing too, right? I mean, I mean what well, can you do about Tommy John? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're, we're creating more of that problem in the current system, which is you know really unfortunate, but Anything that gets players to free agency faster is good for the players, right? Good for labor. Like the, the sooner you hit the open market, the better. And I think and a third rail for the owners. And yeah, I just think they would be like, nope, we can't do that. I mean, their 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 public proposals go the opposite way. Oh no, they they're not going to be free agents until they're thirty. Like, get out of here with that. Like, th- think about that contract that Whit Merrifield signed a couple of years ago. He signed that because he had no leverage. He wasn't going to see free agency for four or five more years the time that he signed it and he was already in his late 20s that's a horrible situation you don't want players to end up there true well i mean he got some money but i mean (laughs) not not for if he had got to the big leagues at 24 or 25 or 22 or 23 if he got there faster like i mean Mm -hmm. again this is 
this is a total like straw man sort of argument, but it just that that's a pretty extreme example. But that that's a bad outcome for a player. Mm. It's better than most players who come in as late as he did. That being said, it's not a good outcome overall. So one right, thing last... I was surprised about, though, I keep coming back to this. The minimum is so big for me because when I looked at how many people were affected by changing the minimum, it was fifty four percent. When I looked at how many people were affected uh, by axing the last year of arbitration and making the free agents in that in that year, it was fifty four, which is five percent. Yeah. That's why I think it's kind of a, it's not a silly argument. It's a legitimate argument by them, but it's also like a waste of time and energy in my opinion, because it's like the 1%, right? It's like fighting for the top 1%. They already, these people are already going to, I mean, what percent of them, you know, are going to eventually become free agents? Probably pretty high, right? If they make it that far, they're probably- If they make the third, yeah, if they make it the third, the third year, year, but yeah. I, only 54 last year, <laughs> like if it, not that yeah, many. Exactly. Yeah. So right. it's like, well, we, yeah, there's a lot of pat. There's like there's extensions. There are non-tenders. Yeah. So those guys. Have. Yes. Well, your point is those guys would get paid anyway. Yeah. Yes. When I look through that, that's very interesting because the 54 that I look through, I would say about 50 of them will, will go on to to be like legitimate free agents. There's like yeah. four like relievers that made a million dollars in their last year and are kind of injured and you don't know if they'll get another deal. There was a few of those. Um, but I think even, you know, I would count Heath. Hem I think Heath Hembury was like that, where he's like, a you know, third or fourth year of arbitration, made a million dollars. I think he'll get another deal. So I don't know. Like there were it was it was it was mostly guys who make free agent anyway. So um, I, I like I'm just I'm laser focused on the minimum. <laughs> and the, 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 the in the NBA, three percent of the NBA is on the minimum. Yeah. In the NHL, yeah. it's like it's like 18 percent. Yeah. So no, I agree. I think it's a, I think that and trying to incentivize competition mm -hmm. in my mind are the two biggies. And if the players get those, then they just kind of quit while they're ahead. So, yeah, yeah. Because if they're, if they like, if they keep attacking arbitration and, and the owners just keep saying it's ridiculous, then like a lot of those, you know, last year, if they could cut a year of the minimum, now that would be a big deal because there's cascading effects, right? If you only had two years of the minimum and then you start getting into arbitration, that that's a big deal. But, um, I think that would be, I don't think that's attainable for them. That might yeah. be worth fighting for though. That might, that might be one of the bigger sticking points is yeah. Okay. The, the years of control, you still get six, but it's two and four instead of three and three for everyone, not just for the super two players. Cause then you start doing better a lot faster like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I do think anything that puts some pressure on teams to make a decision sooner about a long-term deal that's going to open up more opportunities for players as well. Hmm. Yeah. You know, but like, most of those deals seem like pretty team friendly. Yeah. But yeah. If, if a player hits the open market, there are more bidders looming, right? So it's going to incentivize a better offer. You're, you're a little closer, right? You're doing, you, if you're doing better along the way, you can possibly wait that extra year before hitting free agency. So I think that does bring the quality of those long-term extensions up a little bit. But there's also a competitive balance aspect to this, right? If you do cut the minimum salary year, uh, what I found was among the team, among the players that get to the third year of arbitration, the top half in spenders, right, had an average of sort of three to four per team, right, and then yeah. uh, the bottom ten or so had an average of maybe less than zero, like less than one, like yeah. somewhere between zero and one. Yeah. So if See, you cut that, the... that means they're going to be trading Andrew McCutcheon faster. Yes, that was going to be my, my counterpoint, too. And also, like, our team's going to want to go even younger because, okay, the zero to two guys are cheap once they hit yeah, that. They'll still, they'll still focus in on the zero to two, right? They'll it's, still and focus if it's on like, those guys. And if, it, if they keep it down to, like, 500000 or 600000 then 600000 in the first two years, in the third year, uh, he's going to jump already to millions and millions. And then the fourth year, you know, like, so you can't even, the Rays would just start, you know, start teams that are all rookies, which they always do anyway. But like, I mean, in a in yeah. a perfect scenario, which is utopian, and we're not going to get there, you, you're arbitration eligible once you're in the big leagues. Like, there's a minimum salary when you arrive, but then now you're going to arbitration. You're eligible for that right away. So when you come up as a 21 year old rookie and you almost win the MVP award, oh, guess what? You're going to get paid 20 million dollars in arbitration next year, and eventually that system, after a few years, goes away, and they have to extend you. At least I then. think that's a little bit like other sports, right? Like if you think about the rookie contract scale, 
you come in if you're a first pick, you get a decent amount of money in other teams in other leagues. Here's the issue with that though: arbitration, the money never goes down. So say you have that MVP year and you make all that money, and then you're not very right. good. Teams are stuck paying you around that amount. That's the thing with arbitration is that these guys are always making more money, even if they have worse years. Right. So this is why I that is a little to too. Right? Yeah, I would be. I, I think that's a crazy idea. That's a little too like teams can't. Te- all of a sudden, now the race can't afford Wander Wander Franco because he's good. Yeah, but they can't. They they can't afford him. That's the whole point. Like that's. But they, under your system, should. he gets paid from the jump. So them being smart enough to draft him and and stuff, all that goes away. The whole point of being a good drafting team is you can have young, cheap talent. Right. So under and your system, the, they can't the, do that anymore. The, but the whole point of a drafting system should be getting the best players. And the whole point of any system of, of compensating people for work should be paying the best people the most money. Like that, yes. that's, the, that's the ultimate goal. Again, it's utopian. It's it's not going to happen quite like that. But if you if, if you think about this from the, the big picture perspective, who should get paid in the long run, right? The, the young we, young players should get paid while they while they can get paid right like Juan Soto should be a top 10 player based on salary right now and he's not that's that's just how it should be and instead we're trying to play this game where is he going to get the extension is he going to reach free agency and and get the first 500 million dollar deal like we we play these sorts of games but the goal ultimately should be how do we get him compensated like the player he is faster that yeah. That to me is the bigger problem that they're probably trying to solve that, or should try is. to solve, but I don't know. I don't think they're going to get anywhere near this utopian thing that I'm throwing out there. No, I, I agree with that. But paying them from the jump, I think all of a sudden now you have teams that just can't afford to be good ever. Like there goes the raise. Yeah, I'm trying to think now of other sports. So, like, you know, how do you win in Milwaukee? Well, you get Giannis, right? It doesn't matter how much you pay Giannis because there's a salary cap, right? And yeah. so now you just need to rearrange the the chairs around Giannis because you got yourself a superstar. Yes. So if, if the Nationals had Soto and they were basketball, everyone would have to pay the pay the same amount, but they'd be ahead of everybody because they had they got Soto. Yes. And it wouldn't matter how much they paid Soto; it's just they got him. But you need a cap. So now uh, under so. This, this utopian system, Derek wants you would need a salary cap. You have it. You have so. the luxury tax. You've, you've, you've but you need a real cap. actual salary cap so that with a I floor mean, probably too. So, so that it it's yeah that would be the only way. That's the way these other sports do it. That's the way. Also, in the NBA, you need like one or two superstars to be a good team. Baseball doesn't work right. like that. And baseball yeah. also has a much bigger draft than anyone else. They're paying millions to these bonus kids that are in A ball and double A and triple. So like the money is just allocated a little differently. Yeah. Yeah, the structure of the sport is stupid. Um, that, that, that is that is what this conversation has led me to believe. This was supposed to be like twenty five minutes of the episode, and it turned into the entire episode. And I feel like there can be more. I mean, the the I think it's I think it's fascinating. I don't like it uh, as much as talking about baseball, but it is talking about how, how like what have we talked about in this? How do you win at baseball? Uh, you know, what, what are the structures? What are the incentives to these rules that we're discussing? What do the rules cost to the players? What are the rules cost the rule changes cost to the owners? I mean, I think that it is fascinating stuff. And I think there's more to, to come, honestly, like I, I hopefully, uh, the piece that I have coming out this week will engender some more discussion and we can, we can, I, I, I think it's okay. Like, what do you guys think? Was that, it was, it wasn't pulling teeth, was it? No, no, no! I, it went for an hour. We never even got to any other topics. I was going to talk about the Mets and A's manager stuff, uh, um, but we can save that for another time. Um, they didn't. Neither of them have hired a manager, so that's fine. But finally, like I realized two days ago or yesterday that there were no candidates had been released for the A's. So I spent all day working up a list and finally got a, a little bit of a list together. I think they're going to. And hire it's mostly Kotze. mostly internal, right? Mostly internal. I think Katze is going to be the guy once they lost their bench coach. San Diego Christensen is that how you say it? You know. Mm-hmm. Um, One thing that's uh, kind of interesting about the A's is when I did that. Uh, oh, we haven't written that piece yet. Uh, but uh, I looked at uh, for this piece that's coming up uh, about uh, you know the best job in baseball. When I was looking doing some, um, I looked at uh, average tenure uh, by position and by organization, and the A's I think had the highest average tenure of any role 
you know, in their organization uh, as an organization. So they keep their guys like, you know, the people like Darren Bush has been with the organization for like 15 years. Yeah. Uh, Scott Emerson, their pitching coach, has been with the organization for like 13 years. So I think that is an or that's already a, a big sort of check mark for the internal candidates, which are Darren Bush, Mark Kotze, and w- w- was there another internal candidate? On the uh, yes, it was their bullpen coach. Because Bush is their hitting coach, right? Yeah. Uh, let me check my Twitter feed over like a Joe Espada and like a. Uh, what is it, Matt Quattaro, right, by Tampa Bay, the bench coach, right. who is one of the guys who I reported. Well, Espato and Quattaro come up every year, and For I'm surprised they haven't in. gotten an offer. You know, I put I, I put Espato in one of my pieces, I think, three years ago, and, uh, and everybody who works with him in Houston says Espato is amazing. Why does Everyone, it feel like Mark yeah. Kotze already is the new manager of the A's? Like it's just see, it, like that just yeah. makes sense in my head. Like A's manager Mark Kotze, yeah, okay, I that, think that so works. too. Uh, Marcus Jensen. Who's is the other one. And I think I, Oakland. I think he's there. Uh, oh, Jensen. Coach? Okay. Right? Is he bullpen mm. or something? Will Venable is another one of the Red Sox bench coach. Oh, I love him. I put him. I put uh, him on my list. But he he gets interviews. But I don't. You know. I haven't heard of him as a finalist ever. Yeah. Yeah, and then I mean, and Aspada I think would be great. Um, it just the Mets to me just scream like we don't need a first time manager after they had Vicky Callaway and. Um, Luis Rojas, it didn't work out. Right. No, I, I, mean, I think that, that makes sense. From One uh, line I wasn't sure about in your piece was uh, about, well, y- you said that the Mets have made the effort to uh, become among the high, the, the best teams in analytics or whatever. Um, I just don't know if they're there yet. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how, what that means. Is that If you're not really the most analytical team, maybe you don't get a manager that's all about analytics then. <laughs> Yeah, well, they've they they twenty six kind of people. Old school manager. They have twenty six people. So, to me, are are you just going to pay twenty six people to do nothing? Like, no, of course right. not. I think, you know, one of the big things about Buck is people think he's not analytical. Somebody actually texted me yesterday that's known him forever that said, back in nineteen eighty five, Buck was asking for the stat pack uh, from How Sports that had to get faxed over twenty pages of stats. The guy like loves info, which I also find to be true. I think mm-hmm. the knocks on him and analytics aren't entirely fair when the Orioles didn't have an analytics department. There yeah. was nobody to ignore. I would love to see him in that. Now, do I know he's going to embrace them? No, I'm not sure. Do I know? it? I don't think anyone is sure. But I think it's really unfair to say that he didn't embrace them in Baltimore when they literally had no department. They had like one singular analyst. And one thing that I think is really important uh, is either giving uh, people in that role autonomy or the appearance of autonomy. <laughs> and so uh, I think that in his, I think in this case, like Showalter sort of brings with himself uh, autonomy. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. this is the guy the, the, you know, like I, I can't go talk to Wilpon around. Hopefully I, I can't go complain to Cohen around bucks, you know, around buck. If I do, Buck will tear me a new one, right? <laughs> and that's that's a that's one of the biggest things that I had uh, in the piece about AJ Preller was that like him having a direct line to all these people under the people he'd hired creates this like oh I can just go talk to AJ if you know I don't like what what Tingler is telling me. I, I think there might be something too like putting Showalter and been like, no, you talk to Showalter. You know, <laughs> the Buck stops here literally. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Sorry. Well, I I think we made Derek twenty minutes late for his meeting. So sorry. Uh, that's already that's out. That's not happening. Um, <laughs> um, I have I have declined the invite, and uh, the show has gone on without me there. So this show can go on a bit longer if you want. Do you want to talk about some non CBA stuff? I had other questions. I had I had mailbag questions we could answer if you guys want to hang. No, around let's. For a bit. We, we we've been gone for a while. Let's let's keep those for next week. All mailbag. Right. Yeah. See what what sort of new news comes sparkling up, and maybe some more CBA debate. Well, if I said that the question you sent us was on the rundown for Wednesday, I lied accidentally, not by design. So that is now on next the Wednesday for you Monday. Meant. Next or Wednesday. next Wednesday. They just roll over. That's that's <laughs> yeah. the that's the trick. That's the good thing about a rundown. Sometimes you could just roll it over to the next day. Uh, if you want to keep reading about the CBA and everything else going on in sports, get a subscription to the athletic, 33% off the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Check out that Ken Rosenthal piece that we were talking about. Check out Britt's piece. Uh, about Buck Showalter and the fit with the Mets and 
look, I, I think this is um, this is what we're going to get for news for a while. Managerial stuff, coaching changes, and minor league deals. So uh, questions are definitely welcomed. You can send those at ratesandbarrels at theathletic.com. If you prefer emails on Twitter, she's at Brit underscore Giroli. He is at Eno Saris, and I am at Derek Van Riper. If you're still watching us on YouTube after nearly 70 minutes of CBA talk, you are a saint. <laughs> please be sure to barrel up on the like button. That is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. We are back with you on Monday. Thanks for listening.